I was a real West Side guy, surfed a lot. I was living in a guest house in the marina. Jesse Easter actually suggested that I move into the American Hotel. Jesse and I worked as professional art handlers on the West Side, really high-end, fine art. He goes, look, you know, come downtown. I go, I don't know, Jesse, it's a little dirty, it's a little scary. Nothing like tech today at all. There were two kinds of animals, pigeons and what Jesse used to call euphemistically street squirrels, which were rats. Today we have like little babies and designer dogs and things like that, which we never had before. So he said, just come down here, Terry, stay for three months and you can move back. I went, mm, okay. So I walked in, no security check, no first and last. If you walked in and you had $300, Mark Chrysler would give you a key. I moved in just in time for the earthquake in 94. <laughs> Jesse seemed to be really happy that I got this great room. So I go over to the window, looking down, and I could see into the apartment across the street, and Stacy was staying there at the time. And she walks up to this full-length mirror with the most lovely, cute little black lingerie panties and bra you ever saw. And she's checking it out from this side and checking it out from this side. You know, such a sexy gal. And I looked down and thought, maybe I'll stay for a while. Jesse was going to Al's bar in the late 80s, and he would drag me along, and I was just completely blown over by the scene. When I was a kid, my grandmother always talked about burning your candle on both ends. These were those people. And some of them had even lit in the middle, it seemed to me. In the heyday, you would see three wonderful, angry punk bands every single night. It's like living above the merry-go-round, in that if you miss one horse, you just wait 10 seconds and another one comes by. I'd never had my social life literally right downstairs. One night, a guy named Jake Labatz came up and blew everybody away. He was so good. And then you'd see him in movies, you know? He'd pop up in some movie and be very good, by the way. This was sort of like a sleepy little lagoon as far as the LAPD was concerned. It was abandoned warehouses. Nobody was claiming this territory. It was just a bunch of mangy artists who had kind of moved in and squatted. So the cops that were in this district, they just cruise around. Especially when Blooms put in cigars, we became the LAPD's best friend. When I came down here, I kind of felt like a spy in the House of Art. The people here were so dedicated, they had all found something bigger and more important than themselves. Their paintings and their writings, they were saying, this is what I believe in, this is what I'm passionate about, which was something that I would have never done unless I came down here. You felt like you should be contributing. I had a thing called TV Terry's Sidewalk Cinema and we would project cartoons and things right on the wall next to Bloom's. When I was a kid, you'd go to the movies and you'd see three cartoons, coming attractions, and then the feature. So what I would do is I'd follow this old format. I would always make sure that it all had a central theme. So if we were doing a monster movie that night, the cartoons would be about Casper the Ghost or something like that. Bride of Frankenstein was a big, big night for us. And this is one of those films that as you watch it as an adult, it's an entirely different film. And to stand there and watch all these people locked onto one idea at the same time, and I sort of hooked into what these people were doing and why they were doing it. The one thing about this community, everybody supports everybody else. It's like being Amish in a strange way. If your barn burns down the next morning, you wake up and you look at those green hills and all of your neighbors are coming over the hills to help you rebuild your barn. Everybody was your friend. And in my personal situation, when my heart went south, 33 of my friends came together, did a silent auction, and raised $5,000 for me. Put it in my hand. More than my own family. So if you have friends like that, you know you're doing something right, and that you landed in your part of the forest. And when I landed on, on Traction and Hewitt, 
I found my people. My next door neighbor was Mike Gonzalez. He was born and raised in East LA, and he figured that if he stayed uh, east of the river, he'd either be in jail or dead. And so he moved over here and he lived with us. Unfortunately, Michael had a bit of a drug problem. He referred to it as hair on. And he had this wonderful camera. He would knock on my door and he'd sell me the camera for $80. And then he'd go buy drugs, and then he'd come back and he'd buy the camera back. And so this camera went back probably three or four dozen times. So every time he would knock on my door, I would be watching my television. I'm going to call you TV Terry. That's how I got to be TV Terry. There were two Dons. There was the mythic Don, the world traveler. Whatever you talked about, he had done it bigger and better. And then there was the real Don, who was actually a waiter on the Amtrak. It was very hard to get that kind of information out of Don because Don really enjoyed the life that he invented in his mind. Don would come down literally in his bathrobe and in his ear, he would wear his keys. He would sit down and tell the biggest lies ever. But he would tell them in such a way you really kind of wanted to believe him, you know? The intricate way that he would paint the picture with the details and take you on these epic journeys, he was beguiling. There were young kids, there were artists, but then there was this, this retinue of old people like Barney, who had lived here since 1946. There were three Georges. There was George Joaquin. Then there was old George. And then we got another George, which uh, Jesse Easter christened new old George. He was kind of the, a mystery boogeyman that lived at the end of the hallway. His room looked like a mini Sears and Robot. Whenever anybody would like either get thrown out or move, they tend to just leave stuff behind. So any television set, toaster, any sort of like cheap little appliance, George would abscond with and hoard in his room. Stacy was as much a part of Al's as, as the supports and the walls and the rest of it. Just an easy person to get to know, very warm and very real. We just became such good friends. We had a deal. I would uh, roll her a big fat spliff and I, I never paid for beer. If you ever got into any kind of game, the foosball or the pool table, she'd bleed to be a wonderful woman. You can't tell the story of downtown without Jim Fittipaldi. The first incarnation of Bedlam was basically the studio. He literally opened his house and his heart to everyone in this community. We always used to say about Jim that he was kind of like Tom Sawyer on the day that he had to paint the fence. He had a way of drawing you into his ideas. Bedlam had sort of a 40s feel, like sort of a gangster feel, sort of a modern day speakeasy with a very strict dress code. You couldn't come in without a tie on. And the women loved it. These women could really dress up. And what that did was it kind of put us in sort of a Manhattan cocktail party world where everyone was being terribly sophisticated. You could go in and play three different kinds of poker. Penny ante, dollar, and then the heavyweights. Pool table, fashion shows, art shows, and it turned from a speakeasy to a salon with a speakeasy vibe. Probably the artist most associated with Bedlam would be Emmerich Conrad. There's something about these people. When you say Bedlam or you say Owls or you say the, the Arts District, you're talking about a lot of people who uprooted themselves, followed their heart. As Brendan Bean says, that the continental shelf of North America is tilted to the west and all the fruits and nuts roll down to the west coast. And Bedlam was definitely proof of that saying because everyone there came right off the page of a novel. And it was a novel I wanted to read. And we had a drawing workshop on Tuesday nights that grew into something divine. Kilsonic would come and play their tubas and like fire would come out of the tubas. Jim had this gravitational pull that you would just get pulled into this new world. Jim loved gangsters. His favorite gangster is Mickey Cohen. 
So we did the uh, Mickey Cohen secret hideout. Rick Mendoza set up a booth to have your mug shot taken. And this is mine. And we all had our gangster names. Terry the Hat. Bedlam truly was a group, and it was a, a state of mind. There was one full moon night that was just... And I remember my friend Sam Nira, he worked with me at the bar, and he looked over at me that night and he said, you know, Terry, this is too good to last. In my maternal side of the family, we were sort of born with thin heart walls. I don't want to be defined by having a heart transplant, but the interesting thing is how this community treated me when I got back here. I had received my gift and I got a room back in the hotel. It was early in the morning. I pulled my van up out front and I was thinking this is going to take me three to five hours. So I'll just put one foot in front of the other. Raymond came around the corner. Oh, Terry, you're back. Oh my God, what can I do to help you? Within 10 minutes, I had seven people, seven, helping me. My stuff was in my room, done in 20 minutes. This is the essence of this area. I mean, the one thing I came home with that I didn't have when I left was the knowledge, this is my home. I've lived in about four or five of the different rooms in the hotel over the years. This one's my favorite. I think this was Jet Jackson's room at one time. If you live in the artist community like this, you end up with a lot of photographs of yourself, portraits, drawings. You buy a lot of art. It just kind of goes along with living in the hotel. Emmerich did this for me back in 02, and it only took him three years to paint it. These were very young, very engaged artists, all kind of inspiring each other. There's a thing in India that's uh, gems that have all woven together. And you'll put a candle behind this thing and it'll light up a room. Each facet reflects off the other and makes this thing glow. And that's kind of a wonderful metaphor for what happened down here on a human level. So many people that were so talented and had so many divergent stories and they all ended up at the same place at the same time. And it was fucking magic. We all understood what each other's soul had thirsted for. This is another Emmerich Conrad piece. This is called Jim's Place. Jim Fittipaldi. This is Jim behind the bar. Um, he drew me as Peter Laurie, which I just love. This is the benefits, the treasure that you end up with by being friends with artists and living in an artist community. If you live in a community where you're exposed to these kinds of things, it's osmosis. It just seeps through your pores and you start to get an eye for composition. You start to get an eye for a color sense. So you get an awful lot of stimulation. My place looks like sort of an episode from Hoarders. I'm very sentimental. I can tell you a wonderful story about any of this stuff. So it reminds me a lot of what a full life that I've lived. A lot of people are going to talk about Joel Bloom. What a crotchety old guy he was. I knew a different Bloom. This whole facade of the curmudgeon was masking a very, very sweetheart. I mean, he would just chew your tail off. And the more that you reacted, the more he'd, he'd chew. You had about five seconds to buy a magazine. Then Bloom would be very happy to tell you where the public library was. The library's on 5th. And I thought, I have to deal with this guy every day. I had an instinct that there was, there was a magic key, and I found it. This man was a dyed-in-the-wool White Sox fan. It hit me. ESPN. Just before I'd go down to talk to Joel, I would turn on ESPN and I'd find out what the Chicago White Sox had done that day. Ripped by Edgar Martinez to left. It's gone! And the Mariners have the lead! I go, what's with the bullpen? Jesus Christ! <laughs> I'd get the cigarettes, I'd, get the, I'd leave the money, walk out the door, and he'd still be grousing. I had to do a little research, but it, that worked for me like a charm. It was a beautiful thing that they won the World Series in his lifetime. He said, I can die happy. <laughs> if you only knew him by the publicity, you didn't know him, but he was one of the sweetest guys ever. Where we're sitting right now, I'm looking at about five examples of Joel Bloom's influence on this neighborhood. He brought order to the chaos. This bus you're hearing in the background, the dash, it's pulling up to this tree, 
both of which Joel Bloom made happen. He insisted that we were a vital part of the city when they did the dash. He insisted that we have a stop. Bloom's general store was not just a store. He provided a general meeting place. It was just kind of all happened around Bloom. Every once in a while I'll come down and I'll have a, a cup of coffee or something with a friend and I'll cast my mind back to maybe 10, 15 years ago where I was sitting in the exact same place and when I tell you tumbleweeds would roll down traction, I'm not exaggerating. It was the forgotten part of the city. Nobody else wanted to come down here. It took a rough and tumble type of person to, to live down here. Everybody had a survival instinct. We all loved each other and we all celebrated in each other's good fortune. I don't think any of us were thinking about the future at all. We were just surfing a big golden wave. Certainly the best part of my life, for sure. This neighborhood's given me an awful lot. Cut.